All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Torah Studies. This is our weekly look at the soul of the Torah portion. Torah portion this week is Shlach. And boy, oh boy, do we have a class tonight. This is going to be amazing. This is epic. We have a tremendous, tremendous group, both in person and online. Ray, I cannot tell you you've made my week, my month, perhaps even my year. I'm not sure yet. I'll let you know at the end of the class. Here you go. This is for everybody. You get a copy. You get a copy for like Oprah. You get a copy. You get a copy. And you got it. Yes, Sandrine. I saw that. Sandrine's already hooked up. Okay. All right. And don't worry, online crew, I got you covered. We will jump in in a moment. I need to get this the right the right copy here. Okay. So let's get started. This week's Torah portion is Shlach. And of course, I would say the highlight of this Torah portion or perhaps the low light, low light, highlight, is going to be, is the story of the spies. So I'm going to give a quick recap, a quick chazara, which means recap of the story of the spies. And uh, then we're going to jump into our main topic, which is going to be the notion of divine providence and what it means for you and I. But we'll get there soon. Let's start with the spies. All right, shlach literally means, the word shlach means send, send. And so what's the meaning of send? This week's Torah portion. So what happened is it's about a year after the Exodus. And the, huh? Oh, no worries. No worries. It's, it's cool. No, no, it's fine. It's good. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. So a year after, I'll just go. A year after the Exodus, the Jewish people are at the, near the border of the, of the promised land, the land of Israel. And it's time to make the final approach. They're a, a few days journey into the land of Israel. And at that point, the people freeze. The people freeze. And they, they ask Moses, they say to him, Moses, we love you. And we certainly love God and all that good stuff. However, we're getting a little, uh, little nervous here. Let's send some folks. Let's get some intel about the Holy Land, about the Promised Land. If we need to go in, people are living there. What are the people like, right? What are the, are the city? Just what's going, what's going on? We need to know what the lay of the land is before we go in. That makes sense to gather intel. Today, nowadays, you would send, um, I mentioned this to TPP uh, in the last few days, they would send in like drone planes, spy planes to kind of like take aerial, uh, right? Get some aerial uh, coverage, coverage, I don't know, aerial footage, 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 no one uses footage, spy Recon planes. Reconnaissance. No, footage is like back when we had film. Aerial film? reconnaissance. Aerial reconnaissance, no, no. excellent, yes, perfect. Aerial reconnaissance, capture some images, we'll know what's going on, we'll send, yeah, and that, that's, and that would, but then they, you had to have boots on the ground. So they, they, so Moses asked God, God says, whatever you want, you make the decision. Moses says, let's do it. So they, they took 12 representatives of the people, one per tribe, one leader per tribe to go in as the scouts. What's a scout? You know what a scout is? Yeah, like a scout is, when I hear the word scout, I think of baseball. Why do I think of baseball? Uh, yeah, but Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I don't know how much recon they're doing. I'm just saying, like, when it comes to actual scouts, so I feel like, you know, when, when people say they're scouting out minor league talent in baseball, it means that they're sending someone to the game to check out the minor leagues and see, or, or check out high school kids to see who is worthy of being drafted, like that sort of thing. Like kind of like spies, but they're not, like, dressed up with, like, a fake mustache and beard no need for this over here. And I'm just saying they don't need to like dress up in something super incognito. They just go in and whatever. Just... Lewis, Lewis and Clark. There you go. Lewis and Clark. Sent in a spy. Some a, of my favorite scout. explorers. So anyway, so the point is like, so there's, so these 12 are sent in and they're sent in to take, to get some intel and come back. And Moses gives them very specific instructions. He says, go in and, and tour the land, north, east, southwest, go traverse the whole land and double check. Hey, Linda, welcome. And check out the land and see what kind of land is it? Is it good? Is it bad? What type of land? Uh, um, what type of people live there? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are the cities? I said, down, please. Are they fortified? Are they open? What's the deal with the land? And come back and report. And the Torah says they were gone for 40 days. Hey, Marnie. Great to see you. Uh, they were gone for 40 days. And they traversed the whole land. And they brought back some fruit, some very large fruit, like some grapes and other things. It was Gavaldic. And they come back. They brought back babka. And they said, this is going to go around and no one's going to touch it. I am a, I am a prophet. Anyway, so, huh? it's fine. So the point is like this. 
So they come back after 40 days and they, and they call for a national meeting. They call for a massive powwow. Powwow, is that a thing? Maybe. And they say to Mo, they gather Moses and Aaron and the entire nation and the message goes out. Everyone should gather at the appointed time. And the spies, these 12 individuals get up there and 10 of them say the following. We went to the land and it's beautiful. It's flown with milk and honey. And here's a postcard. I'm kidding. They say, here's some, here it's fruits. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. However, FS, they say, however, FS also in Hebrew means nothing, zero. They were about to throw a nothing burger. I'm kidding. I don't know. They thought it was a big deal, but it's FS. It's really nothing. There's like an illusion there in the actual phraseology. I'm just dropping some insights as we go along. Anyway, the point is they say FS, however, ki az ha'am, the nation is strong. The cities are fortified. We also saw the giants, giants, not the giants. That would be like the baseball team that just beat up on the uh, Braves last night. Don't ask me how I know, right? So the giants, San Francisco giants, right? So the, we also saw giants there, the descendants of giants, B'nai Anak, the, the, the descendants of giants. And they basically said that there's no chance. They said, essentially, there is no chance at being victorious, when I say victorious, at conquering this land or going in and surviving this entry. That was their take on it. And because of that, the people panic and they begin crying and screaming and shouting and they start complaining, not complaining, they're out of fear, out of anguish, out of sorrow, out of trepidation. They say to Moses, and why did you take us here? Why are you, why are you bringing us into the land? They said to God, what are you doing? We want a new leader, we want a new God. We demand a recount. This is not kosher. This is not good. We don't like it. And because of that, I'm just giving you the whole story. All spoilers are happening here, right? Spoiler alert. This is uh, this will ruin the drama. Nonetheless, this is what happened is that ultimately God says, if you don't want to go into the land, okay, you're not going to go into the land. This generation for, for the next 40 years, this generation is going to die out naturally over the next 40 years. And your children, anyone under 20 at this point in time, those under 20, they will be the ones to ultimately inherit and enter the land of Israel. And that's kind of how the story ends, um, more or less. But in the middle of all this, there were two of the 12 spies. I mean, they weren't supposed to be spies, scouts. Two of the 12 who remained faithful to their mission. And when I say faithful, what I mean is they remained faithful and trusting that God would see it through and that there was nothing to fear. They were trying to reassure the people, there's nothing to fear. Don't worry, God's got this. Who were these two? Caleb and Joshua. In Hebrew, Kalev, ben Yufuna, Kalev, the son of Yufuna, and Yoshua ben Nun, Yeshua, the son of Nun. Joshua and Caleb. Let's take a look at text 1A. You should all have copies here. It's page 141, text 1A. I'm going to pull this up on the screen as well. Uno momento, por favor. Text 1A. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to call you in person, Ray. And you, I'm just saying, I, for the longest time, you were always right here. I know you're around the corner. Whatever, the times have changed. But you're still close enough. Ray, please read text 1A nice and loud and clear so that our online crew can hear as well, please. Uh, yeah, verse 6. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Yefuna, uh, who were among those who scattered the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to the entire congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we passed through to scout is an exceedingly good land. If God desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Continue, please. Uh, one more verse, verse number nine. But you shall not rebel against God, and you will not fear the people of that land, for they are as our bread. Their is removed from them. And God is with us. Do not fear them. Thank you. So in, I want to focus on verse 9. So first of all, Yeshua and Kalev, Joshua and Caleb, they're the ones that remain faithful. When I say faithful, they remain trusting in Hashem and God's ability to take them successfully into the land and through this journey, through this mission. 
Uh, they tell the people there's nothing to fear. If, if Hashem desires, it's going to be successful. There's nothing to worry about. But verse number nine says something interesting. Um, there's two rationales to not fear. If you look again at verse number nine, it says, don't rebel against God. In other words, don't not believe in God. And you will not, and do not fear, basically, do not fear the people of the land for they are as our bread, which means just like you consume bread. Um, so to, we will consume the nations of the land. There's nothing to worry about. But there's two rationales that are stated in the very last, ver in the very last sentence of verse number nine. Can someone tell me what are the two rationales? Why shouldn't we fear the Canaanites? What, what is the rationale that Joshua and Caleb were saying? Why shouldn't we fear the Canaanites? Number one. Protection. The protection is removed. Divine protection is removed. And number two. God is, God is with us. God is with us. Good. God is with us. So, so number one, their protection, their divine protection is removed. And number two, God is with, with us. us. Those are the two. So the idea that God is with us, fine. But what does it mean that their protection is removed from them? So to this, we have Rashi. Ray, we're going to give you a double header if you're okay with it. Text 1B, Rashi on the verse that you just read, explains what it means that their protection is removed, how and why, and what does that mean? Please take it away. The protection is removed from them. Their shield and strength, their virtuous ones have died, namely those who protected them. Another interpretation is the shade of God has departed from them. Thank you very much. So two, two different uh, interpretations in Rashi that we are going to focus on right now. Number one, Rashi says their protection is removed. What does that mean? They had the protection of a tzaddik. Or he didn't say tzaddik, kesherim shabaham, the, one that was, the ones that were kosher amongst them, amongst the Canaanites. And who was the one that was kosher? Eoiv, Job. Remember the story of Job? He was a righteous man who suffered a lot, but didn't lose his faith in God, even though he questioned, but he ultimately kept his faith in God. So apparently he lived then, and apparently he had just recently died. And basically Joshua and Caleb were telling the people, you have nothing to worry about on the Canaanite side. Don't worry, we got them. They've lost their righteous guy. Their, their merit is gone. That's interpretation number one. Make sense? What's shot number two? What's interpretation number two? Rashi says, now, this works, this works a little bit better in the Hebrew because in the Hebrew, it's, it, the, the word, the phrase is sar, which means it, it's removed, but what silam? What is tsel, the word tsel in Hebrew? Shade, shade. For example, when it comes to a sukkah, the halacha is, Salasa miruba mechamasa. To be a kosher sukkah, it has to have more shade than sun. So if you're trying to figure out your shade sun ratio, your classic shade sun ratio, it's a whole thing. So it's got to be more than 50% shade in order to be, hey. Rabbi? Great to see you. Yes. Is the same as Betselem Elohim, the same, the same root? Betselem, e, no. Cause, well, I don't know. It might be ultimately connected, but Betselem would be in the image. And this is the shade. Although I will say, not to throw shade on in your interpretation there, um, <laughs> here all week, is that there might be a connection between shade and image because your shadow makes your image. So there, right, your shadow, right? Look, it's a bird. Okay, whatever. Anyway, yeah, your shade, shade makes an image. So there might be some sort of conceptual and linguistic connection there. But anyway, the point is like this. Sart Silam, Joshua and Caleb say, their tsel, Silam means their tsel, their shade is removed. Well, again, one interpretation is that their righteous dude, Eo, Job, passed away. What's the second interpretation? The shade of God has departed from them. The shade of God. What does it mean, the shade of God? What does that mean to you, shade of God? What is shade of God? Of oh, the umbrella. Good. Umbrella protection. What's that? What's the insurance company that has the umbrella? Travelers. Travelers. Good. This class not sponsored by travelers. Huh? Where do they get it from? Exactly. They got it from the Torah. Everything comes from Torah. Unbelievable. Some classic uh, book of numbers. So there's the shade of God has departed from them. So again, shade in this context means protection, right? A shade is like a cover. It creates a shadow. 
it, but there's another interpretation as well, or there's another, another angle to this as well. And that is what the nature of a shadow, as I just mentioned, is the way you move, your shadow moves, correct? More or less, it's a good shadow. If it's a wonky shadow, it's like, what is that thing? I don't know what that is. I don't even know what that is. But if it's a good shadow, like you have some good shadowage, then it's going to be pretty much apropos, if that makes sense. It's going to fit what, who you, how you're moving, it's going to move as well. Which means that a shadow indicates a tight connection or it's an organic connection between object and shadow. Does that make sense? Should I try to say that in English? Yeah. A shadow. Here we go. Right. In other words, a shadow is not a separate entity, correct? It's not its own thing. It's the natural result of the shape of whatever object it is that's blocking the sun. Does that make sense? It's like part and parcel of the thing. It's a thing in its shadow. Yes? Every light side has a dark side. Bum, bum, bum. No, right? So it's, it's just part of the natural situation. That's the way it works. Um, so what this means in this case is God is usually the sail. God is usually like intimately intertwined with the goings on and the protection of the Canaanites. So Caleb and Joshua are saying, Sar Tzilam, their sail, their divine protection shadow is removed let's take a look at text 2a this is from a verse in psalms chapter 121 tessa if you don't mind reading this one give me a quick moment i'll put it up online and uh please take it away text 2a god is your guardian god is your shadow he is by your right hand. so here in very interesting king david calls god a guardian and a shadow and the way um the mystics the, the the hasidic masters explain it is that the two points are intertwined shadow is a guardian now what, what does that mean the shadow is the guardian that just like the relation between person and shadow is that it's very much intimately connected so to god is our guardian by our right hand in other words a very close and tight connection um if you don't mind please tessa please continue pay, uh, text to b on page 143. So this is what we call, thank you. This is what we call Mida connected Mida. The way we behave is the way God treats us like a shadow. It's all natural. It's all organic. It's all inherent. It's not like an extrinsic consequence that comes out of nowhere. It's very much part and parcel of what we do. It naturally produces a shadow. Another way to think about this, that's going to just be a, another random example. That's not really going to add much, but I feel like saying it. So there we go. Is um, think about the inside and the outside of a cup. Anyone have a cup here? There's some cups here. Yeah. So you need, when you make a cup, theoretically, you need the inside. Why the inside? Because it holds the contents. You want to be able to hold a hot cup of tea, right? What kind of tea? Oh, nice. Okay. That sounds good. Well, pomegranate tea action. Excellent. So the cup, on, on a very utilitarian perspective, right, on, on, on that level, it's about the inside. But you can't create an inside without the outside. Correct? Go try to create an inside without an outside. It's impossible. Whatever you create is going to have an outside. You with me? It's not, it's not possible. Every light will have a shadow. That's the way it is. Every object will have a, a reflection. Like it's just part of part. So the same thing is true. God is the mirror of humanity. God is the mirror of us. So what we do has an effect. And that ultimately comes back to us, um, which takes us to text number three. This is how the Rebbe kind of explains this and brings it all together in reference to the message that Caleb and Joshua were conveying about the Canaanites. Text number three, Ekaterina, please read this. The explanation for God's shadow is that a person's actions trigger a reaction and cause that in his work. God's shadow is a unique boundary to his space. God doesn't dictate the work that humans do for us, and as such, their actions also trigger a reaction that is caused. Something is bestowed upon them. In other words, when they do a good deed, they are given rewards. And when they commit a violation, the reaction from on high is meted out that necessary action. If it was a violation, then the reaction is likewise destructive and unnecessary. 
And what he means here when he says God shall have vis-a-vis non what he means is referring to our context, which is the Canaanites. In other words, when Caleb and Joshua said, oh, Sar Tzilam, God's shadow is removed from them, what does it mean? It means that typically God is operating with humanity, including the Canaanites, right? He doesn't even say non He says, Umos, only the nations of the world, including the Canaanites. God, God um, uh, responds in a way of a shadow, meaning organically. Someone does something good, great. You want to call it karma, whatever. It's divine karma. You do something good, great. Do something negative, it is what it is. There's a, it creates a natural reaction in the universe on a spiritual level. That's the way God operates, as a shadow. In other words, it's not like you move your arm and suddenly the shadow has to be like, oh man, he moved. Right, and go quickly try to catch up. Are you with me on this? It's absolutely natural. It's 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 organic to the to the movement. It moves. It's it's like it's 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 you moving. So the same thing is true. The reaction, the trigger above when we do something either positive or God forbid the opposite. It's a natural reaction. It's not a it's not a um a learned reaction. There's no algorithm here. It's not like oh UI is learning. You did this. Okay, let's find, figure out what we should do. It's a natural reaction that is perfectly commensurate to our actions. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying. And this is true for Jew, for Canaanite, equally, it's the same thing. Which then, which, and that's typically the way it works, which thus leads to the question, this will be at the core of today's class. This is the question for today. And the question is, what does it mean when Joshua and Caleb announce in front of the entire nation and Moses and Aaron, and they say, Sar Silam, God has removed his shadow from the Canaanites. How can God, how can you remove a shadow? Are you with me on this? A shadow is a shadow. There's a natural connection between human action and divine reaction. It's organic, it's innate, it's inherent, it's intrinsic. So what does it mean that God removed it from the Canaanites? What does that mean? Huh? So one second, so you're saying, that's the saying that, he, that, that they can't see it. Yeah, but either it is or it's not. In other words, either God is involved with them or it's not. And it seems like God is involved with everyone, even the Canaanite. What were you saying, Sindrian? That he moved away. He moved away. But can we really say that God moves away from human beings? Because that, and this is what we're going to get to today, that would fly in the face of the classic idea of divine providence. And that's today's class, divine providence. Divine providence is the notion that God is aware and intimately involved with the goings on of the world, especially as we'll see human beings. Now, that that tenet, I, I'm gonna, I, we could build up to the question, but let me just state it now, and then I'll I'll do the build up a little bit later. And was, let me show you the end of the question, and then we'll build into that question. Okay, the end of the question is, if God operates with human beings both Jew and Canaanite in this example, in a way of hashkacha pratis, which is divine providence, which means specific divine providence. If that's the case, then what does it mean when Joshua and Caleb are saying that God has removed his shadow, that God has removed it? How can God remove something that is absolutely inherent to the human condition? What does that mean? Saying God, you're saying God could do it. The same God that giveth can take it. Who speaks like that anyway? Right, but he's saying if God is granting his providence, he could say, no providence for you, Rhode Island. 20 points and a slam dunk no more like steph curry just shooting threes with one with one eye yeah one eye. That, that that wins the award for the year <laughs> it's hidden so it's not really that it's not that he's not aware that it's hidden Good. Let's let's keep. These are all good ideas. But, but is it, all right, Rabbi? Is it that God removed it, or that people who are insensitive, even though they think they are, can't sense it? Good. good. That it's or, still there. Or maybe I'll, I'll let me. Uh, I don't. I don't mean to cast any shade on your idea, but maybe it's if a person evokes or emits this darkness or this cloak, then you can't see a shadow anymore. You're ready. You've eliminated the shadow because it's all shadow. That's kind of what you guys were saying, right? I'm putting words in your mouth, Steve. Don't worry about it, huh? Saying you need a little gloss as well. Kidding. Anyway, the point is like this. 
we're going to well, let's build into the question because we're still we're still like beginning stages. So what is this notion of Hashkacha Pratis of divine providence? So what we're going to do now is pause, put the brakes on the whole spy issue on the whole Joshua and Caleb situation. And we are going to turn our attention to the note to the the central um, Jewish belief in divine providence. And what we're about to see and we're about to discover is that there is a major difference of opinion amongst the classic commentaries as to what divine providence means and who it's for. Again, the definition of divine providence means that God is aware of and cares about the specifics of what's going on. The question is, who does God care about on that level? Does God care about planets, angels, people, animals, trees, blades of grass, stone pebbles like what does god care about with that level of personal individualized care is it everything is it some classically rambam maimonides says this level of divine providence and again divine providence means individual attention and care only is reserved for human beings that is my, that is the opinion of rambam maimonides we have a lot of very long texts I'm no Rambam, but in Job, doesn't it also end with, and also many cattle? You're talking about the book of... Um, Job. Jonah. Yeah. The other J guy. Uh, Jonah, we read that on Yom Kippur. Jonah was sent to go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish on a boat. He gets swallowed by a whale. Just a normal Tuesday. And then uh, he eventually goes there, and he saves the, he saves the kingdom, and then he's depressed, and then... God says, what? I should have let Ninveh be destroyed. They have so many people and a bunch of animals, right? Good. Excellent. You should know this. Let me just set this up before we jump into Maimonides. That will not be the only opinion. There are other opinions. And famously, uh, the Baal Shem Tov championed the idea, the founder of the Hasidic movement, that divine providence is for every minute detail of creation down to every blade of grass, which explains the email that I sent out about an hour and a half ago. Uh, let's jump into the opinions. Again, these are very long readings that I want to throw in commentary in. The easiest way is going to be for me to read these. So I'm going to jump in right now and, uh, and read some text. This is text number 4A. This is page 145. This is from Imani's Guide for the Perplexed. If you weren't perplexed before this, no, I'm kidding. All right, here we go. God, um, uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, here's what Ramam says. In the lower or sublunary, Sublunary. That's a word that's never used. Add it to your wordle list. Or, under the moon, uh, under the moon. Yeah, under the moon. So what he describes before this, let me just fill in the old details, is he describes on a planetary level how God gives specific attention to the planets, the sun, the moon, stars, etc. Let's continue. In the lower or sublunary portion of the universe, divine providence, listen to this, hot take does not extend to the individual members of species, except in the case of mankind. How many suns does our world have? Universe, whatever the Russian, whatever the language is. One, just one. Ours has one. So, so Maimani says that our sun is divinely, you know, watched over specifically by God. But once you drill down to our planet, and now you have, how many blades of grass are there on planet Earth? And what'd you get? Trillions? More than trillions? 40. Yeah, a lot. There's a lot. So does God have specific divine providence in every blade of grass? He says, nisht, which is Yiddish for not. Not, right? Divine providence does not extend to the individual members of species, except in the case of mankind. I know I read that I'm reading it again. As regards all other living beings, and certainly as regards plants and all the rest of earthly creatures, I do not believe, says Rambam, that it is through the guidance of divine providence that a certain leaf drops from a tree, nor do I hold that when a certain spider catches a certain fly, yum, dinner, that this is the direct result of a special decree and will of God in that moment. In other words, are we going to say that um, Charlotte's Web, that yeah, that was the thing that caught. Um, no, well, that that's also a spider, right? Yeah, that caught fly, right? Let's call him Marty. So, 
Marty McFly. Remember Back to the Future? Yeah, it was a whole thing. Anyway, drop little nuggets of, drop, it's all reach, it's all reach, trust me. It's all reach, it's all like, it's all pop culture, like dating back 20, 30 years. It's like super relevant a, a few, few years back. Anyway, the point is like this. So this spider that catches that, that, that fly, are you gonna say that God designed it in that way? Come on, he says, I don't believe that. That's what my mind is, I don't believe that. Um, I hold, nor do I hold that when a, cat, a certain spider catches a certain fly, that this is the direct result of a special decree and will of God in that moment. In all these cases, the action is, according to my opinion, entirely due to chance. Ooh, oof. Now we get into the rappers. Oh, it's a little bit more modern. Chance to wrap it. My opinion is based on the fact that I have not met in any of the prophetical books with a description of God's providence otherwise than in relation to human beings. In other words, his opinion is Hashgacha Pratis, divine specific providence, only extends on an individual level to members of the human species. Our opinion, our opinion, he says, our, mine, okay, whatever. His opinion, he says, my opinion, is not contradicted by verses such as, you, God, open your hand. from the Yashrei. You open your, I, uh, you God open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Every living thing. It sounds like God cares about every living thing. Or by the saying of our sages, God sits and feeds all from the horns of unicorns. I don't know who translated this. Karne re'emim. It's horns of rams. Unicorns. Someone got very excited when they saw horns. It's like unicorns. I don't know. Someone was uh, getting excited on the translation there. My, my understanding of karne re'emim is horns of rams. That's my edit over there. So God sits and feeds off from the horns of the rams. Those from the largest creatures, rams that have large horns, even unto the eggs of insects. Think of larva. Larvae, larva, larvae, larva, larva with an E. Anyway, think all that. Think all that stuff, right? God is attentive. So, so here we have a verse that says God sits and feeds all from the large to the small. And there are many similar uh, sayings extant in the writing of our sages, but my money says they imply nothing that is contrary to my view. All these passages refer to providence in relation to species on a large macro level and not to providence in relation to individual animals. Yes, God cares about the uh, perpetuation of the penguins. He does, but each individual penguin, right? Come on, he says. You got to be kidding me. That's what he's basically saying. He's like, "Well, you mean to, well, you? I should believe that he's going to care about every single one." He's like, "I don't, I don't." He says, "I don't buy it." That's a chance. It's a chance. Not happening. You with me on this? Yeah. This is Rambam. Uh, but quick question, because you taught otherwise. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Because we're going by the Baal Shem Tov. So we're about Rambam, Baal Shem Tov, like all yeah. So here's the thing. Rambam lived several hundred years before the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov can't come ahead and say, like, let me amend this, like, this, this philosophical tenet in Judaism. So I, 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 I want to be very clear here, as I get my words together, that the Baal Shem Tov didn't create this notion of divine providence for everything, but there were other opinions. It just wasn't necessarily classically accepted on the level of Maimonides, and the Baal Shem Tov brought it back and said that is, according to mysticism, that is the, uh, the, true, the true belief and the true angle. And that's obviously where we're going to go with this, but we're going to get there. It's a journey. I think it's interesting to see what divine providence was thought of in more medieval times and more ancient times and as articulated by, by Maimonides himself. Let's continue 4B. It's again another long one. I'm going to read it quickly. Why should... Oh, now he addresses this question. What's the rationale? He, made a, he, he has a hot take that only human beings are individually... Um, uh, guided and, and, and providenced on, if that's, if we can use that turn of phrase, right? Providenced. So now it's a verb. So why is it, why human beings? His answer right here in text 4b is because human beings have intelligence that is not on the level of God, but at least someone in God's, you know, sandbox, someone in the same, same field. Why should God select humans as the object of a special providence and not other living beings, he asks. One who asks this question must also ask, why has humanity alone of all spe a species been endowed with intellect? In other words, he says, if you're asking this, then ask the other question. Why do human beings only have this level of intelligence? The answer to the second question must be, it was the will of God. It is the decree of his wisdom, or it is in accordance with the laws of nature. In other words, it's the way it is. We don't know why. It's just, it is what it is. Human beings have a level of intelligence that other things don't. 
The same answers apply to the first question. Divine providence is related and closely connected with the, with the intellect because providence can only proceed from an, intell from, an, from an intelligent being, from a being that is itself the most perfect intellect. It's all about awareness. Providence implies awareness. An intelligent being is, is hyper aware. So God is hyper aware. And who's he aware of? Other beings that have intelligence. Those creatures, therefore, that receive part of that intellectual influence will become subject to the action of providence in the same proportion as they are acted upon by the intellect. In other words, the more that intellect is bestowed, is bestowed to a certain species, the more that intellect cares about or is watching over or is invested in that species. Make sense? It's just it's just a, a tighter connection. Rabbi? It's like, just think about this. If Albert Einstein was at a dinner party, who's he schmoozing with? There's perfect, huh? He's going to schmooze with, right, talking cars. I'm the kidding. I'm the science. He's going to schmooze with people on his level. So who's God caring about? Who's God watching over? Who's God invested in? People that are closer. Intellectual beings, human beings. Yeah, Steve. Is that not the B'Tselem Elohim comment I made earlier? Like right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh? Exactly. Yeah, it all comes full circle. Yeah. The image of God, image of God meaning intelligence, therefore God is watching. Now, let's take a look at text 4C. Let's continue with Rambam. It also sets a demand on you. Yeah, well, that's true. But Rambam here has a very hot take. He says people that are less intelligent are probably watched a little less closely by God. He says even within human beings, there's probably a ranking system. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. In accordance with what I've mentioned in the preceding chapter, it follows that the action of divine providence is proportional to the endowment of intellect. Classic Rambam right here. The relation of divine providence is therefore not the same to all people. The greater the human perfection a person has attained, the greater the benefit he derives from divine providence. In other words, getting back to my Einstein, Einstein example, I think it's a decent example. Einstein is probably not speaking to plants. Correct? Probably. You never know. You never know. Yeah. Einstein is probably speaking to people. But even amongst people, who's he speaking with? The people that are intelligent, people that have, uh, you know, this academic knowledge, people that he can, that he feels like he has a sprach with. Sprach means like a, a, the ability to converse. So God, in gen generally speaking, well, specifically is watching over all human beings. And, and But the ones that are a little bit more intelligent, you know, he's got a little bit of a closer affinity toward. This benefit is very great in the case of prophets. In other words, the, the divine providence is strong, right? It's um, it's leveled up huh? in the case of prophets. Is that what the kids say? And varies according to the degree of their prophetic faculty, just as it varies in the case of pious and good men according to their piety and uprightness. In the same proportion as ignorant and disobedient persons are deficient in that divine influence, their condition is inferior and their rank equal to that of irrational beings. They are likened to beasts. He doesn't mean literally. It just means like it's on a lower level. This belief that God provides for every human, every individual human being in accordance with his merits is one of the fun fundamental principles on which the law is founded. Now, all right, we have a lot of stuff here. Um, but what what are some of the takeaways? Um, well, specifically, he doesn't say Yehudim, right? He says all people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is for everybody. And, and we'll, we'll see the rugged shover specifies that. That it's for all, it's not only for Jews, it's for everybody. Um, but there's another element here as well. And, and this, this is a very important clarification. Maimonides is not saying that God is not aware of everything that happens. That's for sure. The question is how attentive is God to that? You can be aware, let's say you're shooting a music video. Remember Yi did a music video at Mercedes-Benz? Yi, is that his name? Yi? Kanye. Oh, he's not Kanye anymore. He's Ye. He's Ye or Ye. I don't know what you Ye? Is it Ye? Oh, such an amateur. Ye. So Ye was there in Mercedes Benz. Remember that? He was doing a listening party, huh? Yeah, the not listening party. And then he released the device. You can mix. That's why I mix my podcast. No, I don't. Anyway, so, um, so he had his listening party. And, but imagine, okay, but not that. Imagine you're shooting a music video. Imagine you're shooting, oh, let's get a good, let's get a good scene. You're shooting a movie. And in this scene, you have, you know, like sometimes in movies, like the lead character breaks out in a song and somehow everyone knows it. It's like, what? How'd that happen? 
And then there's somehow synchronized dancing. It's like, what? It almost seems like a movie or something. And you have like 200 people that are, hey, Karen, good to see you. And then you have um, like a few hundred people that are like all part of this, the situation. So, you know, if you're shooting, you're the director. So your main actor is in the frame. Then you have like all this other stuff going on. Now, if somebody is wearing, you know, if everyone's supposed to be in a certain like type of clothing and someone's wearing, I don't know, uh, a shark onesie, like the Super Bowl, remember that? The sharks, the halftime show, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so yeah, and the sharks were like doing a weird thing. Whatever. So imagine if someone's wearing a shark, yeah? A shark, well, not a shark suit, but like a shark onesie. It's like, stop, cut, not, this is not okay. You can't wear that. So obviously the director's aware of, you know, the, the erroneous shark wearing extra, but like, otherwise, if you're more or less doing what you need to be doing, it's kosher. Now, if the main actor is, you know, is out of step and whatever, that's one thing. But if someone on the side is not hundred percent perfect, We'll leave that for the Reddit threads. Oh, look, mistakes in a film. Ha ha, we can laugh. We can zoom in and laugh at that guy. You with me on this? What's my point? I don't even know. I know my point. My, my point is that in a scene, the director will know who's most important and who's less important. And although the director is aware of everybody, generally, specifically, the director won't care on the same level about everybody. Does that make sense? You care about the one who's front and center, the main actor in the scene, and the extras, Nishka Ferlach, not so bad. Yes? God knows and cares about, on a general level, everybody, specifically, generally specifically. But human beings, he cares more about. So that doesn't take away from his awareness of creation. It just emphasizes the specific um, role that human beings play. Now, this is tied into reward and punishment. Take a look. Take a look at text number six. We're skipping a few texts. Don't worry. Text number six. I just I just uh, summarized the other ones we just skipped. Um, the Ikarim. The Ikarim says the following. Text number six. Inasmuch as God's knowledge embraces everything that exists and happens in the world and nothing great or small is hidden from him. He necessarily knows the animals, but he takes no notice of them individually to reward or punish them for their deeds. He provides for individuals as part of the species, which he preserves and no more, which means the following. Let's say, let's say, huh? You know, when it comes to animals, God cares about the general. Obviously he's aware of the specifics but he cares, he's invested in more of the general species as opposed to the individual, which means like this. If a plague breaks out, if a virus breaks out amongst elephants and a bunch of elephants are dying or getting sick, let's just keep it like, you know, elephants are getting sick. So could we ask like, why this elephant? Should the elephants wonder like, what did they, so was it like, what was their thing? Like, did they, no, the relevance. It's like, it's not, not on that level. But God forbid, when it comes to human beings, even if there's a virus going around, the human being has to ask the question, you know, why me? And what does it mean? That's why, because there's the idea of divine providence. Divine providence means if it's something happens to me, then it's a lesson, it's something I need to take to heart, something that I need to, to work on, both on a physical level as well as a spiritual level. Does that make sense? So the point is like this, in totality. And I'm going to ask your question in a second, but I just want just to kind of solidify this, the opinion of my mind is before we switch to the Baal Shem Tov. Maimonides says like this, God is, let's, let's state what we know for sure, according to Maimonides. God knows about everything. You can't say there's anything outside of God's awareness. Like, oh, I had no idea. Oh, look at you. Like, that's, that doesn't exist. Not the blade of grass, not the elephant, not the person, not the planet. God is aware of everything. But what does God pay attention to on a very specific level? Number one, things that only, that only have one like a sun, a moon, a star, right? Or, and, sorry, and human beings. God is specifically attentive to. When it comes to animals, God's aware of, God cares about the general species, but not the individual elephant, yes. Then how do you explain Pesach and the tenth plague? If God doesn't care about the animal, and takes any notice of them individually, then how do you explain the 
The plagues were for the Egyptians. But that was God. Correct. So God cares about people and silcha. Remember, God is the shade of human beings, which means that if they do something not okay, that's going to affect the universe and, and spiritually, and that's going to come back on them. So it may take a while, it may take a few hundred years, but at some point, their actions okay. begot those plagues on them, and it, and, it, and it involved a whole, I would call, cast of characters, including animals and other phenomena. But, but the question is, when, when, an, when a lion um, attacks a deer in the savanna to eat dinner, right? Deer, buck, is buck the same as deer? Buck? Buck is the male. Buck is the male? Huh? All right. Oh, gazelle is the female? No, but it's more, like it's more. It's more common? Like a lion would attack a gazelle? Doe. Doe. Uh, dear, <laughs> I yeah. There's there's a whole stand up. Uh, I'm not gonna. Anyway, um, back to our story. So when a lion, you know, a lion waits. I feel like the Discovery Channel. A lion <laughs> awaits in the savanna, and pounces on its prey. So when that happens, when that happens, who says lions don't prey? I. Yeah, it's so much, so much better. It's like fine wine turned into vinegar. Anyway, the point is that that when the lion attacks a specific gazelle, I like gazelle, right? Are we going to say that God intended that this lion attack that gazelle at that moment in that place? My money says no. God just cares that there be lions and gazelles, and then everyone's they're all up to their own devices at that point. When it comes to human beings. There's more attentiveness than there's more orchestration when it comes to animals. Now that's my monies. Famously, as we've talked about already a few times tonight, the Baal Shem Tov disagrees. Oh, one more thing. This applies both to Jews and the nations of the world equally, as text eight demonstrates very briefly, which I'll read. Text eight is uh, from the rugged shover. Gaon, the genius of Ragachov, he says, the verse states, and you, God, said to me, Jeremiah, this is not going to make any sense. I'm just letting you know without explanation. I'm going to read it. So be like, what is that? And I'll explain it. I could do it the other way around, but I'm just already in it. The verse states, and you, God, said to me, Jeremiah, buy yourself a field. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, and Nebuchadnezzar shall capture it. In other words, there's divine providence over non-Jews. They, they too are included in divine providence, obviously. You're like, what's the proof text? What's going on? So Jeremiah goes, so God tells Jeremiah to buy a field. He buys a field. You think if you get real estate tips from God, probably solid. However, not that long afterwards, <coughs> the Chaldeans, Chaldeans, is that how you pronounce it? Ransacked the field and they stole the field. Chaldeans. Chaldeans. Don't call Deans late for dinner. No. Anyway, the Chaldeans, the... Um, <clears throat> they're known as custom. The Chaldeans go ahead and steal the field. And so Jeremiah says, what's up with that? You told me to buy a field. He says to God, like, you told me to buy a field and then it was stolen. God's like, that's my point. Just like your field was stolen, Jerusalem's going to be stolen by these guys if you don't get your act together. It was the ultimate, I'm going to call it a prank, but it, was, it wasn't like a prank, but it was the ultimate message. Like, you got a field and it's gone? Guess what, my friends? Tell the people this is what's going to happen to everybody's stuff. Bum, 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 right? That was like the message. What's the point? God is saying that I use the Chaldeans as part of my, this specific one that stole your field, as part of my narrative to, as instruction, blah, blah, blah. So the, the Raga Trevor Gon says that shows that, that those that aren't Jewish, the Chal, in this case, the Chaldeans, they're also part of a divine plan, divine providence, et cetera. You with me on this? Okay, it is what it is. Now, that's one opinion. Let's turn the page, as it were, I don't know if literally or uh, metaphorically, and talk about the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, section three, the Baal Shem Tov changes the rules of the game. And this is dramatically different than everything we've read up until now. And this is the teachings of Hasidic philosophy. A person must believe that even a blade of grass lies on the ground by dint of God who decreed it 
to lie there. I heard in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, I believe in this very language, as follows. He was one of the Talmud of Baal Shem Tov. He said, the students of the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, divine providence is concerned with which direction the blade of grass will lie. Not just that there is a blade of grass, but which direction. Um, one direction. Text number 10. The previous Rebbe writes, for example, a blade of grass, I feel like the translation should be a little bit different. Imagine a blade of grass deep in the forest or atop a tall mountain or in the depths of the sea. That blade of grass may move, uh, sorry, that blade of grass that no man has ever seen may be moving. Every movement of that blade of grass to the right, left, forward, backward for the entire lifespan of that grass is by divine providence, by God who ordained that this blade should live for this many years and move around at this frequency for so long. What's more, and here's where he ups the ante, <laughs> every individual motion of that blade of grass contributes to the overall purpose of creation. Not only is it divinely ordained, but it also is infinitely significant. The aggregate of all the myriad, indeed an infinite number of individual actions from the countless creatures distributed across the four taxonomies of inanimate plant, animal, and human, whew, lots of good words there, fulfill the cosmic purpose of the entire creation. In other words, he's saying it is the aggregate. It is the combination of every individual item from every individual species, all working together with this cosmic symphony. I also can play this game that yields the grand music called life and life's purpose. You with me on this? That's the Baal Shem Tov. So far from Maimonides who says, nah, it's just human beings. Everything else happens by chance. The Baal Shem Tov says every single thing is divinely ordained with specific divine intention. But that means that one caused the other. This is God is orchestrating everything. But the question is, Maimonides had a, had a good argument. Why does God, why would God care about all that stuff? Why would God get so deep in the weeds? Literally, it doesn't even make sense. The Rebbe gives an explanation because we have to change the narrative. It's not a director of a film. It's a mother in her home. It's the woman of the house. See, when it comes to the director, the extra who's like a little bit out of step, loves him gain. Like it doesn't really matter. Let it be. It's fine. Right? But the, but the, but the woman of the house, the balabasta, the balabasta, right? Yeah, the one who's, who's running the house. Every detail is important. Every detail. Down to the color of the napkins that come out on Thanksgiving, whether they match the... You with me on this? Every detail is important. What God cares less about the world than the balabasta cares about, cares about her home? Or I once heard Chase Tao put it this way. He said, um, speaking of film directors... He said the, you know, arguably the greatest director of all time was, or alternatively, alternatively, <laughs> alternatively, who else? No, because I forget the name now. Um, Steven Spielberg? Al Alfred Hitchcock. 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 Oh, all right. Well, I'm glad we have consensus suddenly. And Hitchcock, I don't think I've ever watched anything from Hitchcock, but apparently, I know, I know. No, not, uh, 845. We're doing a screening here. I'm kidding. So Hitchcock famously, at least uh, those that, that know Hitchcock tell me, there was nothing extra in his films. Everything was precise. Everything exact. Every dialogue, every shot, every angle, every shadow. Shadow. He was big into shadows. Maybe. I don't know. And he appeared in everything. Yeah, and he would appear. Every detail was... With specific attention. If Hitchcock could pay so much attention, you think God can't? God's less of a director than Hitchcock? What do you mean? What do you mean? But the Rebbe used the example of a balabasta. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at uh, text 11. A simple example from everyday life. A successful homemaker or matron of a home is such that, she's, that she supervises over every detail inside her home, ensuring that everything is in its proper place and that all runs smoothly. What's more, every detail in her home contributes to the overall purpose of the house. Not only is every detail on its own important, but every detail contributes to the overall situation. 
Nothing is for waste, and it can be said that nothing in this house is missing. Neither is there anything extra not serving the overall purpose of the home. If it is so with running a physical home, certainly it is so with the creator and master of the universe. Every tiny detail and event is by divine providence. What's more, every one of them contributes in some way to God's purpose for creation. It's so beautiful, but all of this ups the ante and ratchets up our anxiety factor manifold. Because whether it's according to the Baal Shem Tov or according to the, the Rambam, Maimonides, the question now is even stronger than before, which going back to the story of the spies. So Caleb and Joshua say to the people, why are you panicking? God is with us. But the first thing they say is, Sar Silam, God has removed, or whatever, God has removed his shadow from among them. He's no longer paying attention to them. What do you mean? Even according to Maimonides, God pays attention to humanity, to every single individual. And even the Canaanites, and certainly according to the Baal Shem Tov, God is attentive to what's... So you want to tell me that God... You want to use another expression, fine, but what does it mean that God removed his shadow? That seems to be patently untrue. So the Rebbe explains the following. Going back to the example of the Balabusta, of the mother in the house. Let's say she decides that what, what, what would work perfectly for the house are a, a kind of a... You know, it's a bit of an industrial feel of the home. There's like exposed brick walls that are painted with some fake trees. I'm just describing this room. And there are blue velvet. What color is that? Teal? Is that teal? I'm referring to some specific stuff here. Teal, not chartreuse, right? I'm kidding. Teal couches, teal sofas. Let's call them sofas that have what I would call modern geometric, uh, bright white based, bright colored geometric pillows. Yes? And let's say she decides that's going to be, I'm just describing the room here, that is going to be the perfect touch down to the detail of the fabric of the pillow and the style. That's going to be the perfect touch for this room. But let's say she brings it in. And let's say her kid is allergic to the pillow. Guess what's going to happen? But she cares about the pillows. Doesn't she care? Oh, wait, say so get rid of the kid? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Or alternatively, right, get rid of the pillows. Yeah, but doesn't she care about the pillows? Doesn't she, isn't she attentive to every detail of the pillow? Not anymore. Not anymore. In other words, you mess with my kid? You mess with my kid? No shade for you. <laughs> or all shade for you. No more DP. No more divine providence. No more Ashkach Pratis. You're out of the game. Right? Don't mess with the kid. And that is what, and that is what the Rebbe explains. That is how the Rebbe explains this. Um, uh, text 13, final text. <laughs> text 13. Let me read this one as well. Here we go. The divine providence over the Jewish people is not out of utility. Rather, it is simply because God chose us from all the other nations. God desires and loves us with a love that transcends all reason or logic. In other words, the point is it's different with a kid than the furniture. Even though the mom is going to be attentive, you know, the woman that has to be attentive to all the details of the home, a kid is different. God chose the very being of every Jew. As such, God's providence over the Jewish people is a one-sided providence that is not contingent upon the spiritual states of the Jewish people. God's providence never sways regardless of a Jew situation. This one-sided and essential connection between God and the Jewish people is not limited to the overall nation. Rather, it is with every individual Jew. Each one is considered God's child. The bond between a parent and a child is absolute, and it doesn't flow from rational explanations. If it's about pillows, you can say, I still want the pillow. If it's about your kid in the pillow, it's going to be your kid um, that stays. As it doesn't flow from rational explanation, rather it's simply that the child is the very flesh of the parent. Thus, even if the child rebels against their parents, the bond is not severed for something so absolute and tied to the, very, to the essence never simply expires. So it is with every individual Jew. They are the child of their father in heaven. All of this is being is used, uh, we're using to get to the final point. And that is, Caleb and Joshua say to the people, you have nothing to be afraid of. Everyone's crying. They're screaming. They're wailing. They're bemoaning. They're, they're freaking out. Why? Because we're done. We're goners. We're going to go into land, and they're going to, they're going to slaughter us, God forbid, right? The Canaanites are going to eat us, and then they're going to eat our lunch. Like, it's going to, like, we're done. 
We are grasshoppers and they're going to destroy us. And they say, you have nothing to worry about. God has removed his shade. And we ask, well, what do you mean God has removed his shade? There's divine providence and everything. God is aware of everything. God is intimately involved in everything. What do you mean God removes the shade? The answer is that yes, God is aware of everything. And because of that, when you mess with God's kid, yeah, you're in trouble. That's the way it is. You're in trouble. What they mean is, what they meant is not that God is unaware of the Canaanites. God is very much aware of the Canaanites, but because they're, they stand in opposition, even though they were just, I know at that point, they were just living their life, maybe their hashtag best life. But anyway, the point is that they would, they would potentially serve as a foe, as an enemy, as, as the antagonist to the Jewish people's destiny in the land of Israel, to their rendezvous with the promised land. At that point, their shade would be removed, meaning they wouldn't stand a chance. They would not provide any real obstacle or obstruction to the, uh, to the destiny of the Jewish people, because although they also have divine providence at that point, that divine providence cannot get in the way. In other words, the detail of the pillow doesn't get in the way of the kid who has an allergic reaction to that pillow. Make sense? So what's the moral of the story? Number one, buy hypoallergenic pillows, obviously. Right? And I think with that, Diana, with that, we have like beautiful life lesson. But number two, number two, and most importantly, is that every single one of us is loved by and cared for, is loved and cared for by Almighty God. God cares about us. God loves us. Our value is not tied with what we do. This is one of the major mistakes that we make, especially today. Somebody, you know, we meet somebody new and we say, what's your name? And then what do you do? Those are the two big questions, right? What's your name? And what do you do? And we size up ourselves and each other by what we do. And this class is reminding us that it's not what we do, but it's who we are that matters. We live in a world that's very utilitarian. In terms of what do you do? Show me your bank account, your 401k. Show me your home. Show me your car. Show me your Tesla. And then I can tell you if, if you're valued or not. And Judaism has a different metric. And in generally speaking, every single element of this world is important. Every blade of grass, certainly every human being, right, is important, not only individually, but collectively, not only today, but the entire dramatic history of, of, of the universe. Every single one of us has a unique role to play. Every single one of us has a unique place in this world. And therefore, every single one of us has unique and infinite value irreplaceable value, not fungible value, but infungible value. I don't know if that's a word, infungible. But not, you know what fungible is? Fungible means you can exchange something for something. It's the same thing, essentially. Right? Human beings are not fungible. It's like the story of, of the mom who one day gets this in her head that her kid is like, I don't know, it seems like her kid is not similar to either her or her husband. And so she, she decides to do a DNA test. Turns out the kid's not related to the, to the mother or the father. And she's shocked because she went to the hospital. She had a kid and brought the kid home. She calls her husband, emergency, come home from work. He's like, what's wrong? Just come home. She says, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you about this, but I did a test on the kid and it's not our kid. And she's like in tears and he's totally calm. He says, yeah, I know. He said, you knew? I, I, how, did, how did you know I didn't know? He's like, um, it, was, it happened at the hospital. She's like, what are you talking about? He's like, don't you remember shortly after the kid was born, after a baby was born, you handed him to me and said, can you go change the baby? Amen. That's the joke. You don't change the baby. You change the baby's diaper. I'm saying language matters. La change the baby. Can you change the baby? Change the baby. Mrs. Pfeffer, you raised him. Yeah, by the way, listen. Uh, well, hold on. Don't ask any questions. I'm pretty sure we're related. Listen, the point is like this. The, pre the point is like this. You can't change people. You can't swap out people, right? People are not change the baby. It was a joke, right? You don't just... You can't change one person for the other. Everyone is unique. Everyone is infinite. The fingerprint is different. 
The iris, iris, is that a thing? The eye, you could do some eye scan action, maybe. I don't know. That's what Elon Musk told me or something. <laughs> anyway, every, every one of us is unique and individual. And once again, we're reminded about the idea of divine providence, that God cares about everything. God cares about every one of us and everything we do matters. Never believe that your value is devalued, that you are only a cog in something and whatever, you're replaceable, you're part of a machine, you are infinite, you are valuable, your birth was God saying, it still is God saying, you matter, and you matter to God, you matter to every single one of us, we all matter. Thank you for joining me tonight for Torah Studies, it's great to see everybody. And uh, glad that you're here. We have such a nice uh, in-person and online group. Pleasure. Thanks for being here. And Ray, thanks for being here. Yes, sir, Koa. All right. Questions or comments? Feel free to jump in. Yeah, my fellas. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, it always it, it occurred to me. Not always. It one time occurred to me that the Jewish people had to fight several battles after they got into the Promised Land. And I was thinking about it. they they weren't trained soldiers. I mean, they, they weren't like these military people. Right. And I, and I was discussing this with my son Ezra, and he said that, that through divine providence, Hashem really won their battles, but hardly anyone was ever killed or missing from all of those battles. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. When you look in the books, uh, like post five books of Moses, when you look into the books of um, Joshua and Judges, and you see all the battles, very relatively few Jews died in those battles. Um, the battles went on for a long time. In general, there were seven years of, of fighting and then seven years of, um, of settling the land. So 14 years total before they really were settled in the land of Israel. But even after those 14 years, there were still battles that were ongoing. Even, I mean, even through the times of King David, right? He was fighting. He was David and Goliath. Goliath was, you know, a... Uh, a nudnik from the other side. So like there was still like peoples that were around and causing problems. So that it stayed around for a while. King Solomon was and things were finally peaceful. Shlomo, shalom, peaceful. So that's when it finally happened. But yeah, you're right. There were there was stuff that was ongoing. And yeah, when since how were how were the Jews trained? I don't know. Yeah. Divine protection. And that's what Caleb and Joshua were saying, really. It's like, don't be afraid. God's got you. Um, well, first of all, Bob Dylan has a song, Every Grain of Sand. So I know he's oh, nice. Anyway, um, I don't know why it's a question of the, the Hashem's divine providence in the Canaanites. It seems like it's divine providence. They said, okay, he's favoring us and just take the, we take the protection. I don't, why did they even question that? I don't see. So Elio is asking a great question. The question is, one second. God is, what, what, what Joshua and Caleb were essentially saying was that God is watching the Canaanites, right? Every move you make, every breath you take, I'll be watching you. He no, not oh, is that the, the was that the jealousy? Oh, I don't. Anyway, was, that, was that a stalker? stalker, stalker. Oh my okay, god, that song was a stalker song. Well, yeah, oh really? Yeah. All right, creepy alert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, so back to the story. So yes, you could have said that what it means is God is watching. And God does not want them to be to stand in the way, so therefore God's going to get rid of them. But that's not what they said. They said Sar, Sar Tzilam, God has removed his, his providence. So there's a difference between God's providence dictating that you're going to lose versus removing the providence altogether. So the way, and, and I hope the distinction came out in the ultimate uh, ending of the story, and, and look at the pillows again. The pillow means that you don't, it's not that you're punishing the pillow, it's suddenly you don't care about the pillow anymore because my kid has allergies to the pillow. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, I, I don't, the pillow doesn't matter even. It's not like we have to stab the pillow. I'm getting really violent here for no reason. <laughs> but it's not like we have to like destroy the pillow, destroy the pillow, eyes in red laser beams or something, cue up the cartoon, Futurama stuff. It's more of like at that point, that pillow that was the perfect accessory in the perfect place that was going to finish off that room. Don't care about it anymore. That's what it means. Anything that stands, it's just like, nope. So you're right. It could have been if they're going to stand, get in the way, then God's going to, but it's like, it's just, it's even deeper. 
it's more it's more just like yeah sorry when you're talking about god <laughs> intelligent stuff on it, it yeah like a schmuck, a is not yeah the way i understand it so first of all first of all my money was a philosopher and, and it was brilliant. so no but one of the things of philosophers is that they look highly at philosophy you with me on this yeah, yeah. Sure. aristotle yeah. said that the only thing that survives after a person passed away is their intelligence so like philosophers are into intelligence right that's like that's their world and anything else is like not that valuable to a, to a thinker on that level i'm not trying to like you know pigeonhole my mind is to say he was like although he quotes aristotle extensively obviously he came from uh, uh, he came at everything through jewish lens but the point overall here is that um according to that conception it means the wiser you are, and he uses the example of of the prophets the more tuned you are to spirituality and to intelligence the more there's a there's a connection there's more there's a thing does that mean that someone who's just like you know I, a simple person God doesn't care about just means that there's going to be more tension over there. Rabbi Ari? Yeah. So okay. I'm, hello there. It's so good to see you. So I'm really hung up on this space between Maimonides and the Baal Shem Tov yeah. because essentially what Maimonides is saying is that a person that is of a lower IQ is not as worthy for divine providence as someone like an Einstein. I, I have problems with that right away. First of all, you know, I I'd like to believe that even, you know, that people that of lesser quote unquote intelligence can actually have much like an autistic child or something who can be very high intelligence and um, and still you know have performance uh, problems, but you know that that the the one with a low iq still has in some in some cases may actually have a thinner veil between what they see in this world and what they see in the world beyond much like a child has a thinner veil because they don't have the preconceived intellectual um definitions of things and perception of things and and um and and judgment of things so I, I have problems there, but then I also have problems with the Baal Shem Tov saying that God, I, I, I love, I mean, I, I, I embrace and accept and love the idea that, you know, all of us are important. Every, everyone is important. But this idea of always being watched over, you know, I mean, tell that to, tell that to the parents, you know, in Uvalde, Texas. I mean, it, and, and, you know, it goes back to why do bad things happen to good people and all that other stuff. And, and, I, and I get it. But you, on one hand, you've got you've got this you've got the two extremes. You've got Maimonides saying, oh, you know, you have to be worthy for divine providence. You have to be intelligent. You have to have the intellect. And then on the other hand, the Baal Shem Tov saying. We're you know, everybody's important and God is always watching. Right. You know? Um, so, uh, you so know, good question. So, I, excellent question. So, I'll, I'll address I'll address each one in turn, just very briefly, because they're yeah. they're good questions and they really require much more much more attention than what I can you know much more justice than what I can do in very briefly on one on one leg. So, number one, just to be very clear, I don't believe I don't believe my is saying that if you have a lower IQ, then God is less interested in you. I think it means more of a spiritual sensitivity and a, a spiritual attune, uh, attuning. Somebody who's more attuned spiritually, right, is going to have more awareness on their end and therefore have open up that channel on a, on, a, on a wider level. In other words, if you're tuned in, you're tuned in, you're locked in. Like the example that I always give is right here in this room, there are radio waves, right? If you had a radio, like a standalone radio, like a standard AM, FM, Right, and you dial, right? You dial, you turn the dial. You would pick up the baseball game, right? You pick up the Braves game, or some FM radio, right? You would just pick up some. You pick up music. Where is it? It's here, but you have to turn tune into the right frequency. If without tuning in, you're not going to hear it. So it requires tuning in. Someone who's more tuned in is just opening up that channel. That's what I understand my mind is to be saying, because when you measure intelligence, who measures intelligence? There are many forms of intelligence. 
Some people are great uh, reading comprehension. Some people are great visual learners. Some people are great auditory learners. Some people are great with emotional intelligence. I don't know, and, and you, you raised a good point with, in your question, different examples of different forms of intelligence. So I don't believe that my mind, I don't see it as, you know, any one of us saying, you know, you're in, you're out. It's more of a, a, a reality. It's more of, when I say reality, I mean, I, I think it's more of a, an opening up because I, the, the, the operative example that he uses is prophecy. A prophet wasn't the smartest person. It was the person whose intelligence, whose mind, because he speaks extensively about this, um, a person whose mind was so removed from concrete things that they could be open to the abstraction of the divine. And so someone who is attuned to spiritual stuff, and again, that could take the form of some of the examples that you gave, right? On, on a stronger level, the child who's less concrete and more abstract because children are less, right, concrete, that happens over time. So maybe the child in that childlike state and that dreamlike state can be more attuned. So I don't know that it's necessarily drawn along traditional intelligent. I don't think my mind is, see what I think we're doing, and it's not, a, it's normal, is that we, we hear Maimonides and then we fit it into stereotypes and say Maimonides is being stereotypical. Meanwhile, the question is, did he do that or are we assuming that he meant that? So there's, there's, the, there's the gap that we may be filling in that we may therefore be leading to a question that he didn't even mean. He might have meant that the child is even stronger in this area. I, I don't know that he didn't. He, ta he talked specifically about prophecy. Now, so that's the only thing I can comment about with regards to that. But I believe that intelligence is measured on different metrics. And again, the more open a person's mind is to spirituality, I think that's, that's kind of the lines that he's going. To the second point, what you're really asking is not, I don't even think is why do bad things happen to good people? That's part of it. I think the bigger question is how does Hashkacha Pratis, divine providence, align or jive with free choice? And that's a question that I cannot answer. I've been sworn to secrecy. No, the, it's a very involved topic. There's two questions that people typically ask. Well, there's one question that people typically ask, but this is much deeper. The question people typically ask is, how is there free choice if God knows what's going to happen? That's not a question. That's, that's a fake news question. Because knowledge is not the opposite of choice. Compulsion is. If I know that, that when I drop an egg, it's going to fall, my knowledge doesn't make gravity work. Knowledge is not the same as compulsion. Knowledge is not for, are you with me on this? Yeah. Knowledge doesn't equal force. Knowledge is just awareness of something. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So the fact that God knows and we still have choice, that's, that's fine. But the question that you're asking is the question that's asked in the books of Kabbalah and Chassidus, Chassidus philosophy, which is how do we reconcile? How do we fit, on the one hand, specific divine providence and free choice? Is God orchestrating it or did this guy choose to do it? You're asking the emotional question when this happens, what are they supposed to think? But it's not about any specific question. It's not about any specific action. It's, a, it's an overall question, right? And that is when somebody makes a choice, good or bad or in the middle, who did that? Is that part of the plan or is that their choice? If it's part of the plan, then they shouldn't be punished or rewarded for it. If it's their choice, then it's not part of the plan. So then where, where does God fit in? Is it? It's very simple. If divine providence means that everything that happens is part of this master plan, yes, that means God has it scripted. So then do we write any of the script? And if we do, can we surprise God? I can't answer this question. I can't answer it because on, one, on a basic level, it is unanswerable. It's two fund foundational tenets that are fundamentally diametrically opposed to each other. And the answer that's brought in Kabbalah is that they each exist on different realms of reality. God's providence, God's divine providence exists on the level of Keser, Keter. And our choice exists on a lower level. What does that mean? No, I mean, I really appreciate your explanation and your transparency of what Question. you you know, can, uh, I don't, can answer and what, what is, I, yeah. but I just, just to clarify that. And, and it's, it's not just speaking from a place of ego. I don't believe it's that I can't answer the question. 
I don't believe that the question is answerable based on seichel, on human, on human um, intelligence. Mm -hmm. This is, this is of, of all the questions that someone could ask, this is the one that is, even Maimonides asked this question. And he responds that this question is unanswerable. We actually had this, we actually had this um, conversation in a previous course called, um, called um, What Is? And one of the lessons of the course What Is was a lesson on free choice. And in the lesson on free choice, this was, this was discussed. Three opinions, Maimonides, the Rivid, and the Osfot um, Yomtev. Anyway, it's a, it's a good question, but at the deepest level, you can't really understand it. it. You have to chalk it up to God. Where do you see God in the confluence of paradox, in the impossibility? God is not logical. It's not a logical formula. God operates in the space of, when you know it's God, it's when it's operating in the space of the impossible or the paradox, and this is the ultimate paradox. How God can create a world in which everything is scripted, and yet free choice is granted. It makes no sense. That's where you find God. Oh, thank you. That that's you know that's not gonna that's not gonna soothe the no. grieving parent's heart. It's not gonna soothe anybody. But the question that's that's what that's what's said about the question. As far as our job is not to answer the questions for God. Our job is to do something. That's that's what it is. Our job is to do is 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 to is to be there and to change things. That's our job. Anyway, all right. Um, it's a lot to talk about. To be continued. Thank you, Rabbi. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. It is great to see everyone. It's amazing. We'll see you guys. All right, Lila Tov, everybody. We'll see you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. See you soon.